be the best you can be in whatever you want to do. Yeah. Whether that's being a teacher, whether it's being a father, whether it's being a mother. You have to find your own way yeah. of doing whatever it is you're doing yeah. and be the best in whatever it is you're doing or whatever way you choose. Yeah. We spoke about it when you're becoming a father. Hmm. Said so people can say whatever they want to you. Yeah. But you have to find <laughs> your way as a father. Yeah. My podcast, The Steve and Sally Study, is all about my ongoing study um, to looking at successful institutes, corporations, and definitely individuals. Guy next to me, um, I was just saying before we started, he's not just an individual, he's a brand, and I believe he's got one of the best attitudes I've ever come across. He's achieved so much. I consider him a good friend now, and um, he's someone that, even when I had my baby boy uh, last year, he's someone that I could pick up a phone and talk to him about fatherhood. So Anton, thank you very much, bro. No problem, man. Thanks for having me. No problem. The obvious thing that most people are going to see is footballer. Yeah. I know you more than just a footballer. Um, but how did... I, I'm going to take you back to a story you told me, which was you was on a tour bus. I think you was on um, the season to finish. I don't know who you were playing for at the time. But you went over to Malaysia or Asia somewhere and you got off the tour bus and there was all these fans with your West Ham. Yeah, um, QPR at the time. Yeah, that's it. West Ham uh, jer jersey on or uh, uh, football shirt on with your with your name on the back and number. And it was almost at that moment you thought, wow, like the brand is not just nationally, it's internationally. How does that make you feel? It was uh, surreal. I mean, I was playing for QPR at the time. Um, Jason Park was playing for QPR. Yeah. And he's like massive, he's like their <clears throat> David Beckham. You know, of the Southeast Asia world. Yeah. You know, Man United um, player, weren't yeah, they? As well. for Man United as well, you know, and Man United is massive over there, massive over there. Uh, so he was on the tour with, with us. So was Gibro, Cissé, Joey Barton, who are well known figures, you know. Um, and it was just crazy. I, I, I remember coming off the, the coach, Jason Park comes off the coach. And it goes crazy. Yeah. You know? And then all of a sudden I come off the coach and I couldn't believe it. The, yeah. the reaction that I got, I just couldn't believe it. And I, I realized, it made me realise, like you said, how big the Ferdinand brand was, you know? Um, fully aware that my brother play, plays the majority part of it because he plays for Man United and how successful he's in football. But... They were calling me Anton, they weren't calling me Rio's brother. So it yeah. was like, they, they must like me and all. Yeah. You know, um, so it was really nice to to, to receive that type of love. Yeah. You know, um, also another time come, um, I played in a friendly game. I think this is a story I told you. I played in a friendly game with um, Cesc Fabregas. Cesc Fabregas and friends against okay. uh, <coughs> Malaysian 11. And I came, that's when I came out of the airport came out of the airport and there was West Ham shirts everywhere and I was playing for who was I playing for at the time? Playing for QPR still at the time. And I just couldn't believe it. Yeah. You know, I knew West Ham was big, a big club, but when you go over somewhere like that and you see West Ham shirts, not the the shirt that you're you're actually playing in yeah. at the time, which was a QPR shirt, I was playing at West Ham you know, seeing West Ham shirts and I'd played for Sunderland previous to that. Yeah. And then before suddenly it was West Ham. So we're talking a few years before there was West Ham shirts and I couldn't believe it, you know? And um, that's what you work hard for, you know? You work hard to be appreciated. You yeah. work hard to be successful, but to be appreciated. And, and I mean, coming from the background that I came from and, and the shadow that I was in as a footballer, um, being appreciated was one of the greatest things that I, that I enjoyed in, in, my, in my career. Yeah, wicked. I mean, what, I mean, I can only imagine what it would feel like going to another part of the world where probably you, you, you knew you were known, but receiving that, that energy as you got off the bus, I mean, it must be sensational. Um, so that's obviously now, like in, in recent years, but let's just talk about the very, very start then because um, I read Rio's book, I got a signed copy by you and yeah. him, which is great. I still got it indoors. It's, it's a, a wicked book, good insight. I think it's important to have podcasts. 
interviews, books, that kind of stuff, because people just see these stars, David Beckham, you know, Ronaldo, yourself, your yeah. brother, and it, it's almost like a fantasy world for so many people, because yeah. they detach themselves from like, well, yeah, they've made it, but maybe I can't. But actually, you're normal guys. Like, I've obviously met Rio a bunch of times, you are no pretty well now, even Kieran Richardson I've had on this podcast, really great, great guy as well. And in actual fact, you see you on TV doing amazing stuff, but you, you, you are all normal guys, and I say that with the utmost respect, you are normal human beings. So as a normal human being then, being young from Peckham, I can relate a little bit, I was from uh, Tulsa originally near Brixton, and I know f typically not a lot of people can break out of, let's say, the, the usual mold and then pursue their lifelong goal or vision to be a business person, a footballer, whatever. Um, how, so yeah, the, the mindset that you both had then, your two brothers, how, because how, it must be rare one person turned into a footballer, but two from a yeah. family? I mean, that, that must be unheard of. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you mentioned about books and podcasts and stuff. I'm actually, when I fin do finish playing football, I'm going to do a book on, I know you, you touched on Rio's book and you, you see foundations in that book. Yeah. And my foundation will be very similar. But like you said, in terms of inspiring, other, inspiring people, of maybe having a successful brother and the other brother coming underneath that, it's very very hard so um as you said i'm thinking about doing a book i'm i'm going to do a book which um will help the younger sibling in terms of trying to be as successful as his older sibling carving their own path basically exactly, exactly. but going back to, to to what you're asking me about um growing up and the mindset <coughs> It was, you know, I could have, I'm, I'm saying I could have, I'm saying I could have, but that's the wrong word. Rio done well enough for all of us. Yeah. To not, to, to be able to chill, not, obviously still work, but. Yeah. But. Have less pressure yeah, in life. Yeah, less pressure in life, you know. Um, but our family weren't about that. Yeah. You know, um, my mum, my dad, that's real success, nothing to do with me, you know? Mm. I've got to pay my own way. I'm gonna yeah. have my own family one day, which I've yeah. got now, you know? And that's what it was, that was drilled into me from a young age, you know? I, I could have sat there and done nothing or sat there and had a nine to five job and said to Rio, oh Rio, can you uh, do this, can you do that? I could have done that, mm. I could have done, but I had my own ambitions, you know? I remember Rio, bought my mum a house to move her out of Peckham. And the face that I saw my mum get from the joy of Rio giving her the house was something that I wanted to witness myself. Yeah. Because of something I've done. Yeah. And something I've given. Yeah. You know? Um, not even say, say given, but something I've done. Even when Rio made his debut, when Rio signed his, signed his first pro contract, my mum was such a proud, proud woman. Yeah. It was, um, I wanted that. Yeah. I wanted to see that. Yeah. And it wasn't a jealousy thing because one thing you know within our family, as you've seen between me and Rio, there's no jealousy. Yeah. There's, there's competition, of course, but it's healthy. Yeah. It's, it's um, sibling rivalry, which is healthy. Of course there's it no is, yeah. malice in it, you know, and there's no jealousy in it. Yeah. You know, um, but it was just installed in me that I, had to go and do it myself. I needed to do that myself. And my mindset was, I want to, and I'm going to see that from my mum and from my dad, you know. Um, when I did sign my first pro contract, my mum and dad were unbelievable. They were over the moon, you know. Um, then when I did make my debut for the reserves, when I made my debut for West Ham, you know, they were ecstatic. They were over the moon, you know. And the same was real, it was the same. He was like my mum and dad, over the moon. He was there for my debut, you know, uh, for West Ham away at Preston, and he came to as many games as he could have. Yeah, you know, um, but it was that initial thought of that picture in my mind of seeing my mum's face so happy. Yeah, that was my drive. That was my drive more than anything. It's good. I um, I've got a really good friend of mine who's actually part of the the Mimbo 
Bosa crew on Instagram is called uh, Being Alfie. Really good guy. Me and him both made our names in the sales industry and worked our way up. And sales is all about goals and attitude. Mm -hmm. So I can relate to what you're saying there. And what he says, and I definitely second this and I validate this, when you have a goal, you need to have a real purpose and not against that purpose or attached to it is the reason why. And most people, when they say they've got a goal, whether it's a watch, car, career, do this, do that, they say it because they think that they want they want to pull it out there because it will look impressive. Yeah. Pull it, people do it on Instagram, people do it on social media all the time, but they haven't got the why. So once the enthusiasm's gone, it's gone, and then they can't be bothered to do it. And I think that when you're trying to almost, it's almost like you're trying to get validation for your own family to get that proud moment where they're like, oh, that's my son, that's my daughter, this is what they're doing, it's gonna make their family brand proud. And I think there's no doubt in my mind that yeah, you had skill, determination, but I think that that core thing was to get that 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 recognition from your mum, that one, smile and 100%. stuff. One hundred percent. And when I did get it, I moved on to something else. Yeah, you know, but I still wanted the same reaction, but I moved on to something else. Yeah, it's like an emotional my, my, drive. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. You know, and um, I mean, there's no beating around the bush with it it was hard for me because of how successful Rio has been yeah and how successful he was within football you know um, I mean I remember being nine years old playing for West Ham going to get <coughs> a ball that's gone off the pitch and hearing parents go he'll never be as good as Rio he, he's rubbish oh, yeah. I'm nine years old yeah I'm nine, I'm nine years old hearing that so and if people watch me for 15 minutes in the, or watch, come watch me for a game in the first 15 minutes if I didn't do something that I like and meet a Rio I was rubbish yeah you know so it was tough it's testament to your mindset though again your emotion and your just your, your general well-being because most nine-year-olds they heard that that would have crumbled them they would have believed it they would have embodied it and they wouldn't have been basically achieving what you achieved and I think that that's the difference between Certain people allow certain words and beliefs by external people to kind of embody them and it changes their whole perception of life. Or you take it and go, no, fuck that. I am going to step up and I'm going to just yeah. show and demonstrate to people what I can do. I had a small little thing similar with school teachers saying, I'm not even going to offer you a position in sixth form because you, you, you're worthless to the school. Yeah. Things like that. Yeah. I mean, it's criminal for people to say stuff like that. But um, I wanted to touch on that point because anyone listening to this especially if they're young, doesn't matter who they are. If people are saying this shit, okay, allow them. I would have back in the day wanted to like throw punches at people, but the best thing to do is listen to it and think, okay, I'm gonna show you and then use that as a drive. Of course, I mean, if you look at my career, if you look at Rio's career, when things got tough, that's when you see the best. Yeah. When people doubt, that's when you see the best. Yeah. You know, um, but that, as again, oh, me and Rio, we were lucky. We had a mum and we've come from Peckham. Our mum and dad had split up, but my dad weren't a million miles away. He was on the next estate. He was close to us. Mm. He was <coughs> a figurehead in our life. He was there. A lot of kids don't have that. Mm. A lot of kids, once their parents split up, their dad or their mum, go a while they, yeah. they go off yeah we were lucky yeah you know um so we got a, a, our mum and dad instrumental yeah not just our mum and dad our aunties our, unc our uncles you know our family friends yeah they all, all had an input into what we achieved mm -hmm. you know but the fundamentals come down to the way we were brought up yeah you know like we spoke i spoke about being nine years old being hurt hearing that I'm nine years old, did it hurt me? Of course it hurt me. Yeah. But we were conditioned that whatever was said outside of the four walls in our flat, in our council flat, we didn't care about. Yeah. It was what was said inside of our four walls in our council flat, that's what mattered. Yeah. And as long as my mum and dad and my big brother thought I was a good player, that was enough for me. Yeah. And that conditioned me to think, you know what, you're saying that, okay, that's fine, but I know that's not the truth, and I'm going to prove you wrong. Yeah, sick. You know, and, 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 and that was ingrained in us. Yeah. That was ingrained in us, and it happens, it's happened all the way throughout my, my footballing career. 
I've mm. had setbacks where I've had to go, do you know what, it's time to roll my sleeves up and I've got to, I've got to dig in here. Mm. Whether it be managers that have <coughs> maybe taken a disliking to me or managers that are trying to, to they're playing me, then not playing me, then playing me, not, not letting me get a run. Mm. Managers that I've had arguments with that send me to go and train with the youth team and, and the reserves and I'm nowhere near the first team and I've got to get my way myself back to the first team. It's almost like mind games I've played 100%. with you. 100% and that's one thing I'm happy about as I sit here today in my career, not one person's been able to break me. Not saying some have, I, I believe some have, but not one manager, person in this footballing world has been able to break me mentally and I sit here proud proud enough to say that that's good man um, I want to li- link that to a story you told me and it's the buzz story you know the, yeah. the buzzing one yeah. I don't know if you can talk about it but I well, you've told told it to me twice and I remember it I've actually told it to myself guys because mm-hmm. it's that it's, it's like fuck like we all have a moment like that yeah and um i think he was at west ham academy yeah wanted to get into uh the the first team but it's hard graft because it's not just if you go into academy now you've made it and you're going to become this international star there's many other hoops that you have to go through 100 percent. so rather than me trying to you know come up with like a second hand story of it i'd rather get it straight from the horse's mouth so to speak and you know because i i love hearing it so uh, yeah i mean as a young boy, I've just left school, just done my GCSEs, left school. I think I had 10 days off from my GCSEs to going into pre-season. Um, went into pre-season, my first pre-season, <clears throat> still to date probably my hardest one. Right. Because it's the first one, mentally very, very tough. Um, and not just that, you're going from training three day, three days a week mm-hmm. to every day, it's a full-time job, you know? Um, and but I just love being on the pitch, love being on the grass, training, matches. I just love being on the grass, and I used to, I loved working on my weaknesses. I always worked on my weaknesses, whether it be my left foot, whether it be my head in, whether it be my first touch. Any I used to love working on anything that I felt needed working on. I worked on it day in day out, you know, and. Being a young boy, you know, as you being young, just fresh out of school, there's um, people jostling for, for so one wants to be the alpha, one don't want to be some people, so you're jostling, jostling for your your status within the group. Yeah, you know. Um, so the, a few of the boys, I remember coming in and I'm he- hearing the buzzing sound like. Bzz. And in people that don't know, in, in, in football in change rooms, that means you're busy. Yeah. You're, you're a busy like a body. Teacher's you know? pet, almost. Teacher's pet, busy, busy you are. And lads were saying, oh, you're so busy. And I was like, okay, fine. But I was comfortable in what I was doing yeah. because I had a vision, I had a drive. My drive was there because I had a vision I, I knew I wanted to achieve. You know, uh, so much to the point, I'll get back to the story, but so much to the point that when I left school, I stopped talking to a lot of my school friends who I grew up with because I wanted to focus on my football because at that age, but when I was in school, I weren't allowed to go where they was allowed to go. I weren't allowed to go to Bromley. I weren't allowed to go to Blue Water. I weren't allowed to go and, and socialise. You know, After school, I had to go straight either to football or straight to my mum's nursery. You know, I weren't allowed to go and socialise or go yeah. to the adventure playground. I weren't allowed to socialise. My mum would say to me, what do you want to go there for? Oh, my friends are going there, mum. Yeah, but to do what? What are you going to do? You're just going to doss about. What's there to do? You'll get in trouble. No, I won't. There ain't ever any trouble, mum. But if there is one, I know you might not be involved in it, but you're guilty by association. So I don't want you there, you know? So I weren't allowed to do none of this stuff. And then I left school, passed my driving test, got got my own car earning my own money. So all the excuses my mum had before, you can't afford to go there, Anton. You, how are you getting back? You know, I was now becoming a young man. Mm. I was making my own decisions in terms of what I wanted to do in life. I didn't have that 
So my mum was less, you can't do this, you can't do that. And I knew myself at the time, and I knew if I would have continued speaking to some of them, I would have fallen into, the, into that mode of going out the night before a game on a Friday, go, not even going out to a nightclub, but going around someone's house, chilling, you know, uh, girls and all that stuff. I would have got into that mode because I'd never done it before, and yeah. they always spoke about it. Yeah. So I chose not to speak to them, and the one and when I did make it, I spoke to them, and the ones who understood why I'd done what I did, they're still my friends today. The ones who didn't, I don't speak to them. Yeah. You know, so that that's an insight to how my mind was back then mm-hmm. in terms of always being out on the training pitch. Yeah. Working on my, my my weaknesses because there was only one way I wanted to go, which was as soon as possible into the first team. Yeah. So the lads are calling me busy. And this went on for a few months. I go into training one morning with the, with uh, to train with the youth team, and the youth team training ground is like literally a five minute drive from the first team training ground at West Ham. I was at Little Heath, it's called. And um, Tony Carr, the my youth team manager, came in, and he went to me. Uh, came into dressing room with Anton. He, it's like he he knew what had been going on before. He'd heard people saying, calling me busy and that, because he waited for everyone to be <coughs> in the dressing room. And he came in and he went, Anton, um, you're not training over here today. You're training, you've got to go over, you're training with the first team today. They want, they need numbers, you've got to go over there. And I was like, what, what, me? And he went, yeah, you've got to go over to, to, to Chad Relief. Have you got your car? I said, yeah, all right. He went, well, you better go over now because you're starting training soon. I went, no problem. And he went out. But as I was walking out, I half turned around and went to the, to the boys and I looked at them and went, busy am I, boys? Who's going with the first team, me or you? <laughs> yeah. you know? And it wasn't an arrogance. It was just to let them know that's why I, work. That's why I was doing that yeah. because I want to go there. Yeah. I want the coaches to say, do you know what? Who, if they ask who we should we take... I want my name to be the first name out of Tony Carr or Peter Braybrook's mouth. My name had to be first. Yeah. It had to be. And the only way I could do that was by working on my weaknesses so that when it came to a Saturday playing for the youth team, my weaknesses weren't shown. And that's what it was. And that gave me the, 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 the belief and the the power to turn around to the boys who were calling me busy and, and say to them, who's the busy one now, lads? Because yeah. it ain't me. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm going over there. You know, and that was the start of my journey. Yeah. Of obstacles and things in front of me, you know? Um, <coughs> and it was just, as I say, it all, everything reverts back to my family and my upbringing. Your core beliefs. My core beliefs of... Anything goes wrong, I always go back to the, my bread and butter. Yeah. Always go back to my bread and butter. Go back to the basics. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. The um, the, there's t- two things in there which I know that definitely people can learn from, and I don't care whether they're trying to do be a footballer, boxer, or, or anything they're going to follow. Take sports out of it, even if you're just trying to be the best mother or father you can be, or in business. Um, if there's any weaknesses you've got, rather than shy away from it. Face them, but face, face them, bite down, and, and face it, and actually improve and work on it day in day out, and, until your weaknesses are not your weaknesses, they actually become a strength, and then there's going to be something else. I got a friend of mine uh, who actually lives right next to Rio, actually a guy called Ozzy. He's um, he doesn't know this, but I call him my mentor because even this morning I went down to the coffee shop and went, I've got this kind of challenge with property. Can you tell me about it? And he just walks me through it. It's it's, a, it's amazing. And he always says to me, on a Monday, he goes into his business, and the first thing he does with the with the boardroom, he goes, he goes, right, right, ladies and gentlemen, tell me what the biggest weaknesses in our business are. They all they all talk about it for twenty minutes. He says, okay, what's the solution? And I feel if you can have that mentality in anything you do in your life, you're always going to be winning. Money will come. You know, you'll be a better version of you. You'll attract better people into your life. I think that's a really key lesson that you just displayed there. The other thing is. Who would have thought, and isn't it funny that I had a brother, we've well, got a brother like Rio, got a really, really good family upbringing, but people would think that, oh, he's in the academy of West Ham, um, it must be easy now. But you're still dealing with 
other kind of jealous people or issues with inside that academy. There's there's more challenges you have to go mm-hmm. through. Because I, I would have just assumed back in the day before I got to know you that, oh, now you're in academy, it's almost like you're giving you're going to make it. It's far from it. You've still got to put the hard work, at, hard work, dedication and effort into it. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. There is, there was... Um, good things to have in Rio as my brother. Yeah. 100%. There was good things. I might have got a chance because I was his brother. I might have got more chances because I was his brother. You know? I mean... It's almost like the door is unlocked, but you're the still the one that push it open. Go, I've still got to go out there and I've still yeah. got to perform. He's not performing for me. I've yeah. got to go and do it. Yeah. You know? I mean, like, even... I nearly didn't get a YTS. At, which is a, a youth team sc- uh, contract right. at West Ham because that year I was I was really bad I didn't really play well that year because I was going through a growth spell I was a bit like Bambi on ass if I'm honest okay um, and it was between me and another guy another centre back who was going to get um, our YTS and I believe they picked me over him because Rio had went through a similar transition mm-hmm. so they wanted to see me on the other side of it like they did Rio and that was that was my chance because because yeah. I was Rio's brother they already seen it in him they wanted to see it in me and that's where Rio being my brother probably helped me yeah then yeah but I'd say that's about it really yeah. that yeah. is about it because even coming into the West Ham team being Rio's brother didn't help me it ended me yeah. Like I said, who's, who's this boy? He's not Rio's brother. Mm-hmm. He's shit. Yeah. I heard that so much from West Ham fans. Yeah. Especially on my debut. On my debut, it was my fault for a goal in the first two minutes of my senior of my debut for West Ham. Yeah. It was my fir- It was my senior debut, live on Sky, away at Preston. Ball comes in the box. I try to let it go because I think no one's around me because I've not checked comes and taps it in and the West Ham fans are about, I could hear them. I could hear them. David James giving me a rollicking. He was my goalkeeper. West Ham fans, he ain't no third man. He's fucking shit. He ain't real brother. He's shit. And I thank them for that. Yeah. Because it's, it helped me. Yeah. You know? I remember, it's so what? And hearing all that stuff and I'm walking back into my position I'm looking at the sky and I'm thinking, bloody hell, oh, this is. I'm not it's sure tough. this is for me. You it's know. brutal. I'm not sure if this is for me. But then, like I said, I went back to my core values. My, this is why I worked hard. Yeah. This is why I worked hard. I've yeah. not done anything yet. This, but this is why I worked hard. In the street, in in the playgrounds of Peckham, at the Adventure Playground at Leighton <coughs> Square, I worked hard in there for this. Yeah. I'm living my dream. I'm about to live my dream. It's either sink or swim, Anton. And what are you going to do? Yeah. That's what was going through my head. What are you going to do? Forget about the fans. Yeah. Forget about David James. I'm asking you, Anton, what do you want to do? Yeah. Do you want to sink or swim? Then my mind went back to, I want to see my mum with that face. Remembering your goal. Remembering my goal and my why. I want to see my mum's face like that. Yeah. Powerful. I am swimming. I'm not sinking. Mm. Yeah. And then we went on to win the game. And I ended up playing well. It's good. And it was just unbelievable. That's wicked. Um, so going from being a young man in Peckham, um, playing on the playgrounds and stuff, and then going into being a, a, a pro footballer in the Premier League, and you represented England? Under 21s, yeah. yeah, yeah. a few England, times. Yeah. 18s and, and under 21s yeah. and stuff. Um, you went, you've been to um, Turkey to play for a team now. There's obviously t- talk even still now, maybe internationally at some point. You, you've just been at Scotland at St Mirren's. Yeah, St um, Do you know that transition from like 19-year-old young man now you're a Premier League footballer and what comes with that is a certain amount of baggage, good baggage, there's obviously money involved, we all know that, there's endorsements, there's uh, fame, there's recognition, but what I don't think most people realise that 
I've never been famous, but I've made money. And I know there's a responsibility that comes with making money. People don't realise, they think, oh yeah, you get a bit of money. Trust me, there's a big responsibility with it. And then when you start running teams or companies, there's even bigger responsibility. Yeah. I'm, just, I'm curious, how, 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 do you, how do you deal with that responsibility? Because who nurtured you? Who gave you that mindset or the understanding, the education behind that? I didn't get any. That's the worrying thing. Okay. And I believe that's my next step of come, when I come out of football. Okay. You know, I still want to be involved in football in some way, shape or form. Yeah. But as you know, Steve, I'm, I'm enjoying the financial game. I'm enjoying business side of, of, of the finances. You know, and um, as I say, it's worrying because a lot of these kids, I didn't have any um, teaching of how to deal with my money. Yeah, like mentors or my, people. I didn't have mine. I had Rio to go off of. Yeah. You know? I was, just, I was lucky. Yeah, because he's you know? proper switched on, isn't he? Yeah. But you look at some other athletes, not just footballers, but athletes in general. I interviewed um, Ahara Davis. Mm -hmm. He's boxing soon. Yeah. Um, and even he said, he said, like, you get all this money as a young guy who's also come from an estate and there's fame and you're like, oh, I'll go and buy a car. And don't get me wrong, we've all done it. You know, I've done it. Of course. A nice watch, you know, a nice house and stuff. But that is not the be all and end all of being successful. It's about investing. But you have to go through that. Yeah. You have to go through that period and get that period out of your system. Yeah. To then go and invest. Yeah. You have to go through that. Especially as a young kid coming off of off a council estate. Yeah. But I can buy what I want. Yeah. Get any car I want. Yeah. I can get a Bentley, I can. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. exciting. Yeah. It's exciting, you know? On that note, what was, I'm just curious as well, what was your first ever good car that you thought, yeah, I'm going to go and buy? Range Rover. Yeah. Range Rover was my first yeah. good car. My first car was a Peugeot 206 convertible. Mine was a Citroën Saxo VTR. <laughs> Still today, I love it. Yeah. yeah. Then went and got a, a, remember the BMW Compacts? Okay, yeah. Got a BMW Compact and then got a Range Rover. Okay. Yeah, nice, Range man. Range Rover, man. And then gave my Range Rover to my mum and got a Bentley. Yeah. You know, but um, say, so, hey, do you get, don't get no guidance. You don't get no <coughs> guidance, which is worrying, especially the amount of money that's in football now. Mm. You know, I'm saying that when money was unbelievable when I, when I was young and, and always has been good in football, but now it's astronomical. The yeah. numbers are a joke yeah. of what players are earning today, which is fabulous. Yeah. And which, being a, a footballer myself, they all deserve. Yeah. Because I understand the, the what they go through. Yeah. You know. Um, but they they need guidance. They need advice. You know, because uh, there's a lot of sharks out there. I was going to say there must be people that think, okay, these guys, even women now maybe. Uh, we're earning all this money and they don't really understand the financial markets no. I'm going to tap them up almost uh, get them to invest into certain things which is going to line their pocket and not so good for you Listen, long term I remember having a conversation with you yeah. Steve and, and we're talking about stuff and it's only over the last five years I've, I've started to understand what asset backed and investments are yeah right? investments asset back investments FCA regulated that's their language, which maybe they said to me before, but I never understood it. Yeah. You know, they give you this jargon, they talk in their business language, which makes them look good. Mm -hmm. They tell you, and this is how much you're gonna make. As a thought, that's all you want to know. How much am I gonna make out of it? Not what's the risks. That was never, a, that was never ever a question. Mm. Mm. That got posed to them. Yeah. Would it be myself, would it be somebody else? Yeah. Or if it, if it was posed to them, they were played down. Yeah. But if I would have said, is it asset backed? And he said, no, I know now, I know that's a no go. Yeah. Me. If it's not asset backed, my money is not safe. Yeah. You know? And yeah. I learned that five years ago. Yeah. There's boys at <clears throat> 20, 21 years old who are on between 60 to 100 grand a week. Yeah. Don't understand that. Yeah. And they might be throwing 50 grand into something. They might be throwing 200 grand into something. It might not be a sit back. Yeah. It might not be FCA regulated. Yeah. So the FCA can come after it. Yeah. You know? It's yeah. a problem. Yeah. It is a problem. Yeah. You know? Um, but 
I'm sure that's something we can speak about later on in in this podcast because I'm sure we're going to touch on what I'm going to do after football. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think when I when I, I hate I hated school partly because I was told a lot that I wasn't I wasn't going to do too much. I actually found that recently as well. I got ADHD and stuff. I had to go for a, a thing anyway. That was, I mentioned that on another podcast recently, but I couldn't really concentrate. Didn't really like it. I like to be a bit more physical. I was playing squash like for England trying to do a bit of football, play rugby for the school, uh, boxing, you know, I was re- really like hands on, but when it comes down to the classroom, I didn't like it at all. But I've, re- I've, I've learned since leaving school, education doesn't finish there. Mm-hmm. It should go into personal development. It should be getting a mentor. It should be learning little niche areas. For example, me and my other half, um, we have got a uh, property company together. Before we put any money into property, from, a, from a, a serious point of view. I had a couple anyway, but just dabbled. But really wanted to scale up a big property company. Thought, what's the first thing we do? Go back into the classroom, which it wasn't back in school, but it was go to a proper professional property education company, like an academy, and learn for a year and get mentored and have someone overseeing what we're doing, our deals, analyzing things, keeping us accountable. And I think that if you're going to go into things, I think investing into your education and yourself first your is going yeah. to s- s- lay the foundation so you're still going to make mistakes don't get me wrong it's part of learning but you're going to mitigate some of that risk at an early age yeah um and i think what you just touched on there is you can vouch that continue education having the right people around you and team is going to be key isn't it yeah it is having the right people around you is key um my, my circle small and hasn't changed much all throughout my career, yeah, you know, um, I've got a fantastic business partner in Cheeks who you, you know very well. Shout out to Cheeks, he's a top fella. You know, um, who's, as I say, he's my mentor in business. Yeah, but my business partner. Yeah, he's teaching me the ropes. He, he's, he's um, <coughs> allowing me to to learn new things. You know, yeah, um, which I'm grateful for. You know, and say we spoke about football and we spoke about having the right people around you, but especially for, as footballers, you have to prepare for the day that you're going to call it, the day that you're going to call retirement. You have yeah. to prepare for that day. Yeah. You know, and my agency and who I'm with, New Era Global Sports, um, they've played a... a imperial part in in my transition yeah over the last few years and yeah. what do you want to do when you finish <coughs> you know yeah i was batting it away at first because i didn't want to believe it i didn't want to think about it it's i just wanted to think about football i was batting it away they kept saying it kept yeah. saying it until one day penny dropped the penny almost. dropped it's gonna happen at some point yeah it's gonna happen at some p- i've got to find something that gives me a buzz like a Saturday at three o'clock does, standing in that tunnel, looking out, can't see much, but can hear everything. Yeah. That buzz, I need to find something. Nothing's ever gonna be the same. Yeah. You know, the only thing that's been better than that is having my children and getting married. Yeah. That's the only thing that's been better than that. Yeah. But in terms of work, you need to find something that gives you that buzz. Yeah. You know? That significance. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the uh, more boxing, I'm going to relate this to because I, I, I've never been a, a top footballer like yourself. But uh, a box, you know, and there's been a couple of times in my own mind, even still today, I think, can I give pro a go even a little bit? I still get a little bit of a flavour for it. And there's a good example actually very recently, ex world champion, he used to fought Mayweather, Zeb Judah, he's fought Khan and loads of top people. I think he's 41 years of age. I think there was talks over the week he went into a coma because they had a fight and you're thinking, I thought this guy hung it up a little while ago. And I think what the problem is, it's not really the money, it could be, but I think mostly it's they get addicted to that buzz. Of course. They can't let it go. It's almost like divorcing like your fucking most favourite, you know, your, your wife or your partner and you've got that love for it and you think, oh, I can give it another shot. Yeah. The mind's still there, but the body is just downgraded a little bit. Yeah. You know, 
a 31 year old 21 year old 31 year old a 41 year old there is a big difference yeah and he's obviously got in the ring 40 he's still that 21 year old and bang he's got done and he was in a coma for a short amount of time I, I think he's okay now but it must be a little bit like that for footballers because you've got that that almost addiction to it and that's all you know and the crowd and you know everything I mean is, is, that a, is that a bit of a, a kind of a concern almost yeah it's daunting even still now I know what I want to do when I finish but that initial thought of maybe of it happening is still daunting imagine if I didn't know what I was going to do yeah and it's coming to an end yeah that that I couldn't comp I can't comprehend what yeah. that feeling must be like. Yeah. You know? Um suicide rates within sports stars and not suicide rates, I say depression. Depression, alcohol abuse, drug abuse in footballers who or sports <coughs> stars who finish their career yeah. is is massive. It's yeah. high. Yeah. You know, it's very, very high. And there's a reason for that, mm. which is you just said they can't deal with that not having that buzz, yeah. not being because not being in a change room environment, the banter flying about every day, not having that. Yeah, it's a big it's a, it's a big thing. Yeah, and a lot of it is because they're not prepared for what's ahead of them, but not just that, because there is no advice. It, a lot of it is money. Do you know, you know, it's just dawned on me because it's very, I think it's very similar. And I know that Prince Harry has been a big advocate of this and uh, talking about it a lot. Obviously, the mental health or well-being side of things, I mean, that is, that's always been a t taboo subject until recently, people talking about it. But, you know, like people in the army, the special forces, yep. young men predominantly, the FEMA going into it now, and they go through the terror almost they go to like Afghanistan and places where they could potentially die yeah. lose a limb they see people get shot murdered but they actually become addicted to that danger of course and then after a certain amount of tours they do and a certain amount of years they might be 10 15 20 years in the army and suddenly they come out of the army and they're thrown out into civilization and it's like just get on with it what the fuck it, what yeah. they, and there are homeless people we're in Woodbury House at the moment in the heart of Soho and I can tell you this great area but you walk around and there's a lot of um homeless people and I can tell you right now there's a few of them who used to be in the army and it's almost like they haven't been educated or it's almost like the, I don't want to blame the government I'm not one of these people that do it but it's almost like society have said right here you go get on with it and they don't know what the fuck to do and could almost be similar to athletes yeah you know, 100% you know you're in this it's like a bubble almost a, little, a bit and then low there's so much concentration on you and then the next generation comes up you move on and now you're out into the wild world and I just think it's what you do with that I think you've got a great foundation and a great brand Ferdinand Brand and you could use that really to go into quite a lot of things yeah for sure I mean um, yeah the brand will help massively but unless you've got the right mindset the brand won't do anything yeah you have to have that get up and go, that work ethic. Yeah. For for anything to, to, to work or anything to do well. Yeah. You know? Um But as you say, it's it's just it's a it's a hard one because like you say you don't want to blame people, but people need to take responsibility. Mm. The individual himself, one hundred percent. Because you're in charge of your own destiny, your own goal. You're yeah. in charge of it. Yeah. You know? But I can only speak as a footballer because that's all I've been. Yeah. You know, we do need help in that, in, in, the, in the sense. And it, it is getting better, but I don't feel like they're, the powers that be are focusing in the right areas. I don't think they are, mm. you know? And that's where I see my life going when I do finish playing. So, um so you, you I, I don't know if I could say this, but you're you're sort of um, it's almost a bit of a question mark whether now you're going to do it or you might give it another year or so until you officially retire. Um, it's up in the air at the moment, if I'm honest. Okay. Um, yeah, the thoughts there of of retiring. I love football. You're a long time retired from football. Yeah. You know. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm. I've been away from my family for the last eight months, which okay. was very very hard. Okay. Do I want to do that again? No. Yeah. 
that's for sure and I won't do that again yeah so unless it's somewhere that's close to me or unless it's some somewhere that lights my fire mm. and my family are going to come with me or whether it's abroad yeah and we can go and live a nice life for, in the sun for the next year yeah if unless it's something like that then it could be me calling it a day for sure yeah um, I've always found this quite fascinating I think I, I raised this with you once when we were sitting down at the Curtain Hotel we was in a restaurant there and uh, I was chatting away and it's funny because normally in most careers at the end of the career it's almost like you're kind of seeing the days out almost and it's but footballers now like um, Beckham great example uh, Ro Rooney there's a bunch of us even Henri um, come to the end of the career in the premiership team but then they go over to America or go to another team I don't know in China Drogba yeah. was a good example of yeah. that went somewhere and it's almost like it's like your career started again but in a different sector of the world you've got a new fan base build up your brand even more you actually get more money it looks like more endorsements and I don't know if I'm reading this right correct me if I'm wrong because I don't want to sound like I'm insulting anybody but Beckham goes to LA Galaxy. They're not quite as good as they are in the UK. So they're not like the teams like Arsenal and Chelsea and Man United, etc. So even though he's not as good as he used to be, he's still much better at that level and he's kind of controlling c controlling the team. So he's playing at a level where it's far superior than any, anybody else. He's getting paid more for it. He's getting more life experience and it's at the back end of his career. It seems bonkers. I mean, that must be quite enticing. Yeah, it is. It is. Like I said, I'm not ruling stuff out. You know, um, I do believe I've still got more to offer. My, le my legs, my body still feels fine. It's just whether it's something that's suited to me. Yeah. You know, personally. Part of your plan. Exactly. Yeah. You know, um, that's what it comes down to. But yeah, all that's enticing because I know I could go to America and do well. I know I could go to China and do well. I know I could go to Dubai and I could go to India mm. and do well and play my part in helping. In I was brought up as I was. I was we were never takers. We were givers. Yeah. So give my knowledge. Value. Be, give my value. Go yeah. and add value somewhere. Yeah. I know I can do that. Yeah. It was the same as last year when I went to St Mirren. Yeah. I went to go and play, but towards the back end of the season, I didn't really play as much, but I still knew I was there for a purpose and for a reason. Yeah. And that was to give, to make sure that I, I added value and help the younger players and the players, the senior players around me, get out of a situation that we was in and we end up avoiding re re relegation. Yeah. And um, <coughs> I know I played my part in that. Yeah. I know, um, I was going to say that actually. So. It's funny as well with with football because you're still a young man, 34 years yeah. of age. Like getting into business, you'd be like like I am considered almost like when I spoke to my friend Ozzy, it's like I'm a pup, um, and I, I say that to people that I know who work with me or like in in their twenties and stuff. But as a someone in the 30, 34 years of age, I think you are. Yeah. You go into a dressing room, whether you're captain or not, you must have such the per like the personality where people are. Like, Oh right, okay. Like they, they must learn a lot from you from the mindset, strategic point of view. You know how to deal with emotions because you've been been there. You, you've gone through it yeah, all. Yeah, um, uh, I like I like to think so. Yeah, I like to think so. I mean, I never go into a dressing room and stamp my authority straight away. That's not my character. You know, I'm I'm loud. I like a joke. Yeah. You know, but build morale and stuff. Yeah, I like if people want to talk serious. Come to me and yeah. speak to me. Yeah, you know, um, I like as I say, I'm loud. I'm a joker. I've always been that from seventeen. Yeah, in football to thirty four now. Yeah, in the dressing room, loud. In the training ground, loud. Mm -hmm. When I have a joke, I come to. I go to work to in that building to have joke. Yeah. To have jokes to make people laugh <coughs> for people to make me laugh but yeah, the yeah. minute I get on the pitch I'm serious yeah you know and just that's a lesson for yeah. younger players yeah didn't know Anton Fernand was like that yeah Yo. yeah but then they see on the pitch and they see a different they see a different eyes yeah they don't see eyes that are welcoming they, that welcome you yeah they don't see that they see a focus 
you know, to be yeah. the best I can be on that day. Yeah. You know, even to the point I'm at St Mirren, a young boy named Ethan, 17, 18 years old he is now, played 20 odd games in in um, the first team last year. Just them little things for him. Yeah. You know, um, got to train properly every day. Yeah. You know, there'll be times where, yeah, towards the end of the season, it was frustrating for me because I weren't playing as much. You know, and it was it was frustrating me. Yep. But not one time could he ever turn around and go, Anton didn't train properly. Yeah. I would look at him and go to him, Ethan, like, he'll go to me, you're right, and I'll go, yeah, I'm fine. I'm frustrated, obviously, but I'm fine. And I'll go, and he'll, uh, and he'll go, you sure? And I'll go, yeah, watch, I'll, I'll be the best today, watch. And I'll go and do it. Yeah. And I look after the training session. I go, "What did I say to you before this? Before yeah. we started the games and that?" Yeah. He said, "You're going to be the best." Was I? Yeah, you was. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. The mindset. Yeah. It's also being having a level of integrity. Hundred percent. You say you're going to go and do something and do it. Of and, course. Um, I think with social media today, especially, it's a paradox between it's a good thing because you can promote yourself and touch in with friends who might be on the other side of the world, yeah. and you know, and 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 and, and be current. But then at the same time you get drawn into into like looking at bullshit and it can be a bit of a fake fake world sometimes. Yeah. And I think the integrity is, um, if you're in a place and whatever you're doing, be present in that moment and give it everything you got. Like this conversation, I just hope in my heart I'm giving it everything. You're giving it everything because we want to give value to an audience cool. and loads of little lessons. If you're on a football pitch in the weights room, being a mum, father. Be the best you can be because that's the full definition of living with integrity. And I think a lot of people sometimes, I'm not here to preach because I'm no guru, but it gets lost sometimes. Of course. That's what it is. Be the best you can be in whatever you want to do. Yeah. Whether that's being a teacher, whether it's being a father, whether it's being a mother, you have to find your own way yeah. of doing whatever it is you're doing yeah. and be the best in whatever it is you're doing or whatever way you choose. Yeah. We spoke about it when you're becoming a father. Hmm. Said people are gonna say people can say whatever they want to you. Yeah. But you have to find your way as a father. Yeah. You have to find your way as a father. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That I said that to you. Yeah, you did. You know? And and knowing your character, I always knew you was gonna be fine because you want to be the best at whatever you're doing. Mm. <clears throat> you know? And that's what that's what it comes down to. I want to be the I wanted to be the best footballer. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, I didn't quite reach that, but I'm proud of my career. Yeah. If you set a goal though, and I've I, 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 I'm a big supporter of this. If you set a goal, even if it's sometimes above and beyond, sometimes what you think you can do. I think if you set massive goals and you go after it with full integrity belief you work work your fucking ass off even if you don't quite get there you're still going to achieve a lot i always pick up the same story right i know it's a quite a phenomenon but it's it's one that i think everyone can relate to especially if you're into if you're into um sports conor mcgregor said he wanted to go over to boxing never had a boxing fight yeah and he said he was going to take on who we call the best ever tbe floyd money mayweather and a lot of people wrote him off. And admittedly, he did not win that fight. But doing that transition and putting it out into the universe and saying, I'm going to go and do this. I'm going to go out there with sheer determination and integrity again. Made that tra transition, made the fight happen. Lost it, but guess what? He gained another audience. He got more endorsements. And he walked out of that fight with over 100 million. In my opinion, that's not a loser. And some people may say, who was sitting on the sofa, oh, he fucking lost. Well, guess what? still achieve a lot more than people that didn't set out their big goals. And I think that's really, really important. So if I said to you today, you can't play football no more, what would be the next chapter for Anton Ferdinand? I want to get in the finance. Okay. I'm, I'm, well, I'm one who, I'm in it. Yeah. You know? Um, so yeah, that, I still want to be within football. You know, I think I've got so much to give. I mean, I think, there's a position now, I think, that ain't been in football, I'm talking, as co as a coach, right? There's a position that I think that ain't been tapped into. Okay. I'm 34 years old. I can still move. I'm thinking about maybe <coughs> retiring. Why not coach and be able to train with the players? 
Yeah. Be an active coach. I've done it this year with St Mirren. But not just coaching centre backs, playing with them, because I'm a centre back playing with them, yeah. coaching them through the game. Yeah, there's that. But also the striker. Coaching a striker while you're mark whilst I'm marking him. You know? Yeah, that's really yeah. Joe Bloggs, you should be getting the ball there. I'm 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 tight to you, how are you gonna lose me? Your left back's on the ball, how are you gonna lose me? I'm tight to you, how are you gonna get time on the ball? Can he see you? Can he see you? Because mm. he he can't I, he can't see me, so how can he see you? Yeah. That type of coaching. Yeah. I'd like to do that. It's like leading by example. Yeah, I'd love to do that. I have it at a sales company. Um, I've seen it before where they say managers are trying to direct people, and they can to a degree, but they always have it in the back of their mind. I know I used to as a young, like they say, broker back in the day. Like I think, well, can you do it? Can you, can you do it? You're telling me what to do, but can you do it? Yeah. And when I could see someone actually implement what they're saying, I was like, okay, yeah, they, they, they could do it. You get that, that um, respect straight away. Yeah, and I think if you're if you're directing them, but then doing it, you know, you, you can blaze your own trail in that. Of course, in that, in that part. I mean, everyone says in football, the people who have done it in football, the young lads listen to. Mm. But what about if you've done it? If you've done what they're aspiring to do, plus you're doing it with them, day in day out. Yeah. Before they got to the first team, what type of impact is that going to have on them? Yeah. As young players. Mm. Like, I'm a West Ham fan. I love West Ham, I play for West Ham. I'd love to go back to West Ham <coughs> and train with their 23s day in, day out, and yeah. coach whilst training. Yeah. Love to. The next ones that are ready to go into the first team, let's train together. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's train together, let's learn together. Yeah. Let's educate together. Yeah. I'd love to do that. And that is. And because you're also in finances now, got a good business partner, Cheeks, and a bunch of other people, no doubt. And obviously, Rio, you can uh, go in there twofold as a coach, uh, someone's training with them, leading by example, but then talk about the finances side of things. Of course. Say, right, on the, pit, on the pitch is what we're doing. Off the pitch, I'm going to give you a bit of guidance now because I've gone through this uh, and I know the difference between asset bats, regulated products, unregulated of products, course. the risk to reward, of kind course. of molding them. Some are obviously going to listen, some are not, but at least you're, you're trying to do something. Of course. I mean, I can't speak in depth of what we're doing in the finance world because, I'm, um, because of certain things. Um, but we will have something that will help young footballers, not just young footballers, but young entrepreneurs, young sports stars. Yeah. No, my generation, generation before, where they can understand finance and know their money's safe. Yeah. That's the biggest thing. Yeah. You know, um, because alarm bells are, I'm 35 next year, I get my pension next year. All right? What but a weird thing to say, isn't I it? I know, <laughs> but there's... A pension out of 35. But there's, I think it's two or three years that are younger than me, they get their pension at 40. Wow. But then about five years, that's about a five year gap. And then younger than that is 65. It's, it's, norm, it's the normal pension mm. age. So we're talking about the younger generation now. They're going from earning 100 grand a week, potentially some of them earn 100 grand a week or between 30 and 100 grand a week for, the, for 17 years in their career. To that money stopping, and they're not going to get another lump sum from 30, say they stop at 35, from 35 to 65. Jesus, long they're time. not getting another lump sum. So they got a plan. They have to plan. Yeah, they have to plan. They have to. They they got no choice mm. but to plan if they want to live the same a, a, a similar life to what they have done week in week out yeah the same holidays dubai fabulous yeah. enjoying themselves yeah going mauritius with their family going to to abu dhabi with their family yeah you have to plan otherwise you can't do that yeah you know and the next phase of my life 
will he involve that? It's wicked. Really, really good plan. Um, there's only a couple more things I want to ask you. So, um, whenever I've, someone's asked me about getting into business or being an entrepreneur, again, I'm not a guru. I'm still quite young. I'm still a pup myself, mm-hmm. but I could try and help out where I can. Part of this podcast, my Stephen Sally study, and with Min Bosch and stuff, it's all free. You know, we're not charging anyone. We just want to give value, good content out there, and just be recognised that we want to help as much people as we can. Um, where was I going with this? I was going about what was we talking about just a second ago? Talking about the transition. The transition. Transition. I was there was a point to that. I that as you just forgot. Um, anyway, I'll get back 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 to it. But I think planning for the future is so important because I think that especially in sales, this is my point. In sales, people earn can earn a lot of money and it can come very quickly. You can literally go from someone from a council estate almost or have no qualifications whatsoever. South is the closest I've been to a football environment. Yeah, with the mindset and young young guys predominantly. Yep. And they think it's never going to run out. And I guess if you if you're I guess unlike football, I guess if you, as long as you've got a, a voice and you've got the want to to still uh, be successful, yep. it, it it may it may not, but times do change, regulations come in, laws come in and you have to adapt with it. And sometimes when it does stop, it's almost a big culture shock to them and their family. And I think that people need to recognise from a young age, they need to get educated fast, they need to learn certain uh, markets, and they need to get around the right people, which we, we have t- touched on. Here, here's the point I was going to make, actually. So if they're going to get into finances, investments, their own business, being an entrepreneur, I say the number one thing is, I know this is going to sound a bit weird, but get healthy. And what I mean by that is get your nutrition right yep. and exercise. Even if you're not trying to be an athlete, because at the core of everything is energy. Where's energy cool. come from? It comes from two areas. What you put in your body, nutrition, food, water, and then also how you work your body by pumping the, the, the body with good oxygen, getting the dead, dead cells out. And the, what, the only way you're going to do that really is by exercise. You're a fit man, it's a given because of football, but how important do you think it's been for your mindset, through living a good life, meeting people for the first time because first impressions matter you know being athletic being fit yeah it's it's massive the confidence you have in yourself of being fit i revert back to football the first day of the season the fittest you're ever going to feel yeah after after two three games you don't feel like that but that first game of the season going on the pitch as a defender Looking at whoever you're playing against, going, he ain't fitter than me. I can run more than him. He ain't fitter than me. The confidence you gain off of that. Yeah. When you play against someone who's as fit as you, it puts doubts in your mind. When you're going out and you're going, he ain't fitter than me. Mm. I can do as many sprints as he can. Mm. They can put the ball in their channel where many times they want. I'm getting onto it first. Yeah. And I'll do it again and again and again. It builds confidence. And it's the same in life. Yeah. You know, I'm getting older. My, my metabolism ain't the same as what it used to be. <coughs> so I've had to adjust. I went through many, many years of finishing the season, eating, drinking what I wanted, and then doing a two, two and a half, three week period before I went back of eating clean and working hard. And then I'll shred down in that two to three weeks. That ain't, all, that ain't the case now. Mm. You know, so I've had to adjust, you know, and because of what's happened in my family in terms of like the illnesses that have happened in my family with cancer and stuff, I've, I've looked into a lot of things, you know, as you well know, we've spoken about it, distilled water. Yeah, buying I saw a, it on your story a, the other day. Yeah, I've bought a distiller, yeah. which, which distills the water, which takes away all the toxins, the and, toxins and, and the metal and, and all the stuff that shouldn't be in water. Yeah. You know, um, me and my wife have, have, have recently just come, we're just coming off this, uh, yesterday was our last day. We done a, 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 a four, a five day raw juice and a distilled water cleanse, just for five days. The energy you feel when you start to introduce back your food is immense, just because you've had a, a detox, just because you've had a clean up. Yeah. You know, it's amazing. And when I do finish football, I was conditioned so much as a kid in football, 
you have to eat this, you have yeah. to eat that. That I'm so conditioned that whilst I'm playing, I can't change that type of stuff, mm. you know? But as I, now, when I do come out of football, 100%, yeah. all this, you have to eat carbs, you have to do this <coughs> to train. That will no longer be my remit. Yeah. You know, it will be to train, I need to be energised. Yeah. What energises you? Vegetables? Yeah. Raw juices? Yeah. Distilled water? Yeah. I got a, I uh, bought um, for my birthday in December last year a cold press juice. One of the best things I've ever been bought. I have one every single morning now. Send me that. I'll send you send the, uh, the one I've got and I'll send you my recipe and I'll yeah, tell you right that, now, forget please. your green teas. I'm not saying they're not good. I'm just saying forget your coffees. Having one of these in the morning, what I have, Ruben Tabaris actually gave me yeah. the recipe. Honestly. What a guy. Sus su sustainable energy throughout the whole day. You feel amazing. What a guy. Yeah. Ruben, what a guy. It's incredible. Another, just to touch on one point as well in terms of health, because I, like I like talking about this. People need to understand that all these diseases that are about, some of them lay, lay dormant in your system, that your, um, your immune system don't know about, you know? No disease in this world can survive in a body that's alkaline. Yeah. If it's acidic, that's it, when they become active. It manifests it into manifests, something. It manifests, it becomes active. Yeah. Everyone's got cancer cells in them. Yeah. It's just whether what's in your body is heightening them cancer cells to become active. Yeah. But in an alkaline state body, they can't do that. Yeah. It's impossible. It's part of the reason why I, you know, Pete as well, who's put part, he's been on my podcast as well, so has Ruben, and I get a lot of advice from them. And none of them told me to go like vegan or anything like that. But since last year, I haven't eaten meat. I have fish. I have a very high vegetable, grain, and fruit diet and mm -hmm. cold pressed juices. I stopped doing meat just for a test. Just wanted to test it. I've got to tell you, I feel much better because of, of my sleep, everything, because it's a leaner kind of meat fish. Yeah. It's not as dense and it's not... Now, there's obviously arguments to both sides and, I, and I'm open-minded to both. I've just tested... You said to me just earlier and before, you've got to test um, how, how are you going to be as a father. You've got to learn, learn different things. And it's the same with nutrition and also training. And I've tested this and this works for me. Um, and, it's, and I think it's important how to test, adapt, you know, tweak yeah. little things. Well, I, don't, I don't think I could be a full vegan. I don't, I know, I don't think I know I couldn't be a full vegan. Yeah. 100% I couldn't do that. Yeah. You know, but I will have a balance. Yeah. That's one thing I will have is a balance. Yeah. I will definitely have a balance within my nutrition. So there's not an <coughs> acidic, ain't gonna be up there yeah. and alkaline's gonna be down there. I will always have a balance. Yeah. Alkaline being above it. Yeah. Always have that. Yeah. You know, because I couldn't sit here and say to you, I'm never gonna eat meat again yeah. because that's just not me. Yeah. Yeah. You know? I think uh, the, the, uh, I know exactly what um, the basics that can convert into high acidicness in, in your blood, your pH levels, and it's the typical ones, and I want everyone to listen to this, which is alcohol and refined sugar. I know there's obviously, there's other things like meat and stuff, but you can have a balance, as you said, where maybe having a little bit less, less of it, higher in, in uh, raw foods like fruit and, and vegetables and stuff, but cutting out the sugar and do yeah. it once in a while or drink once in a while. Yeah. I'm not an angel, I'm not gonna say here, I'm, you know, the- People that yeah. know me know I'm not an angel when it comes yeah. to drink. I'm, I'm a drinker, I like to drink. Yeah, I, I like to have a drink. But I think, again, it's in moderation, it's in a balance, it's not yeah. abusing it every single day. Of course. And I think that doing the training and eating very, very clean and understanding what's alkaline and what's acidic and just being switched onto that, I think that's a very, very, very important 100%. thing that you just said. But going back to goals and your whys, the reason why is I don't want my, my kids to see someone who's bigger than what he used to be. Yeah. And another why is I don't want my wife to not want me. Yeah. You know, that's a why. Yeah. So it's down to me to make sure that everything don't happen. Yeah. 
that's why there has to be a balance. Yeah. And that's why when I do finish playing football, I will eat more raw foods and stay on top of what's been created over the last <coughs> seven years. Or the last 17 years, sorry. Yeah, wicked. Good. Um, I want to conclude <coughs> by just asking you a couple of little things. I want to ask you your best moments in your career. Best moments in my career? Or like, even in life. Like I know wife and babies and stuff, like me, definitely up there. But other other things that maybe a younger audience can go like, because they might not be thinking about kids and stuff now, but go for it. Oh, that's really cool. I want to do that. Being able to take my friends to places that they never thought they'd go from being in from Peckham. Nice. You know? Um, meeting people that they thought, oh, I never thought I'd meet him. That type of thing. Yeah, like a big star. Yeah, living living their dreams. Not, because a lot of them want to be footballers and never made it, but living same type of life I have lived. Yeah. And meeting people and going, wow, I've just met so-and-so. Having an insight to that world. Exactly. Wicked. Some of them met Michael Jordan. Oh, man. You know? Today, he's still the, the, one of the best people I've met. He was unbelievable. Yeah. He was unbelievable. Like his personality. Oh, he's unbelievable. So driven. I couldn't believe, I could believe it because of how successful he was, but so driven. He's a real good example because basketball is known for, went into baseball, golf, went back to basketball, smashed it for the balls again. I think he, won won the thing. He played, he used to I don't know if it does now he played used to play golf with Tiger and he used to bet on the holes <laughs> playing against the best in the world obviously Tiger would have less shots to do it in than, yeah. than Michael Jordan but this shows the competitive side of, of the guy yeah. and how much he believed in himself that he's going to go against the best and, golfer in the world and like I said to you earlier about turning yourself into a brand you, there are footballers that when their careers ended and maybe out of choice I don't know or maybe not they sort of fizzle out you never hear from them again you've got someone like a Beckham for example you see that trademark uh, free kick because he's practised it like you mentioned all the time what worked on his weaknesses and it, you've got that symbol of him now obviously Ronaldo got all these, all these people and Michael Jordan was the same but he converted his brand into trainers I heard now that because of the trainers in his brand they've even gone into boxing like uh, Andre Ward used to wear all these all the Jordan gear when he's boxing and I'm yeah. thinking this is a basketball player though and now it's in, in, the, in the boxing and now he's turning himself into a billionaire it proves that if you turn yourself into that brand and you don't have to be just an athlete you could be in other ec- sectors you can go into other things and he, it's such a he's benefit he's on another level though because his 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 brand is iconic man it is that symbol is iconic yeah man. you know what I mean yeah. it's very very iconic yeah not saying the other symbols ain't, because they are in their own right. <coughs> but this is, this is another level. Yeah. You know, and it, his, his brand and the way he is as a person mm. goes across the board mm. in every sport, which yeah. is why he's in every sport. Yeah, that brand stands for something. When you see it, of course it, it does. If it's in boxing or bus, baseball or Even, anywhere, it's just done. It just done a kit for P- PSG last season for their Champions League kit wow incredible it's unbelievable a pair of boots oh my god that's you know? incredible it's, it's, it's unbelievable I mean he's the only person to get uh, the deal that he's got off of Mac I don't know what the what the percentages are but he owns more than Mac do I I, um, I remember something actually as well um about him when he used to play, that they made it illegal for him to wear his own trainers when he was playing. Maybe because of the endorsement deals, because I'm of the sh- I'm not sure or, or something like that. It's what I read. But he still refused to listen. So he used to get fined every single game to wear his own trainers. He was like, "No, fuck you! I'm going to wear them." Yeah. <clears throat> and I love that attitude. Like, kind of going against the grain. He broke the mould, didn't it? Now, yeah. brought, now, now the top players got their own <clears throat> shoes, and they don't get told. They don't get yeah. fined to wear their shoes. Exactly. You know, but it's um. It's just it's it's crazy, isn't it? The things you can do with a, 
the things that you can do with a talent that propel you in life is, is unbelievable. But without work, hard work and graft, your talent means nothing. It's, yeah, definitely. It means nothing. So the other question against that, what has been like some of your, let's say, kind of challenging moments over the last few years? Could be life, could be your work. The most challenging times. Obviously, losing my mum was, was challenging. Um, and the reason being, why well, obviously for obvious reasons, my mum. But anything that's ever happened in my life, mm. I've always had football to take the edge off of it or distract me from it. Mm. And this is the only thing that didn't. Yeah. The only thing that's ever happened in my life and football weren't a distraction. Football didn't take my mind off of it. Yeah. And because that happened, it threw me and I didn't, I did not know how to cope with it. Didn't know how to deal with it. It was my last year at South End as well. And I didn't have a particularly good year, uh, form wise, you know. Um, whereas before, like I said, when your back's against the wall, when people are doubting you, I've always come through fighting. I've always come out the other side. This time I didn't, you know, and it was because all of a sudden football weren't my get, my get out. I didn't have a get out. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, my kids were, my family was, my wife was to an extent, but then my daughter would do something, my son would do something that I would liken to my mum, and I'm back in that same place. Uh, you know, so it was hard. Um, and that's why leaving Southend the way that I did, that was another hard thing, leaving Southend the way that I did with Chris Powell, the manager who's a, who, who was a <coughs> close friend, a close family friend to us. And the way that it happened, I won't speak about it now, um, but I'm sure people will hear about it at some point in my life. Um, it hasn't sat, real, sat, sat right with me. I feel like I've got unfinished business with that club. Whether I'll get to finish it or not is another question. But I feel like I've got unfinished business. I feel I've got a point to prove that the season I had before, that, weren't, that wasn't a one-off. Yeah. Because I had a really good season the season before. Mm. My mum died. And, you know, as I say, I feel like I've got a point to prove back there. Um, whether that happens or not, time will tell. Time will tell, man. Yep. Um, any advice, anyone listening, whether they want to get into football, um, you're like, I'm not just saying it, and um, like you're similar age to me. And when I was started come like left the typical job and went into sales and started this road of trying to be an entrepreneur, and I'm still learning it even today. I still haven't cracked it, but I'm you know I'm always learning. Come on, Steve. You're I'm, being, I'm you're trying. Being being generous <laughs> but you were your name used to fly around all the time because obviously being a footballer but you were similar sort of age to me I was like wow well, it'd be cool to meet you one day and then I ended up meeting you your brother and going to BT Sports and you know yeah. going there and loads of cool stuff has happened you know and just, just getting to know you and I feel like there is lots of lessons that you can deliver to an audience out there so if someone wanted to kind of follow your steps or I know, just be a better person. What is some of the best advice you can give? I know you've touched on so many things anyway, but just to round it, put it in a nutshell. I think you've got to be true to yourself. Be true to yourself, I think. That's the, know what your core values are and be true to them core values, you know? Get, them core values will always be your bread and butter of no matter what, no matter what you're doing in your life. No matter what's happening in your life, yeah. your bread and butter is your core values of what have been installed in you as a kid, what you've installed in yourself. Because some people don't have parents, they don't have role models. What you've installed in yourself. Things get tough and you don't know where to go. Go back to your core values. That will put you in good stead to achieve whatever it is you want to achieve. You know, mm. because like you said, you might have a goal, but you have to have a why. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You might have a goal. Yeah. But you have to have a why. Yeah. Even for someone who wants a wants a watch. 
Like I say to young lads, it's not now, it's not I say to people, your goal being money and your drive being money, it's not a bad thing. Don't have to talk about it so much where you look arrogant or you you know, you don't you don't need to talk about it so much. But if money is your motivation, use it. If your goal is a watch, I'll tell you, you know what it is. If you want to buy a watch or you want to buy something expensive, if you want to buy a car, that might be a goal, but evidently there's always going to be a why. Yeah. That why might be to impress a girl, but that's a why. Yeah. It's like an emotional drive. It's a, it's a why. Everything has a why to it. Yeah. It's finding your why to your goal will propel, will propel you to achieve what you want to achieve. So me just to, to, to run it off, it's um, having core values, always going back to the basics. I yep. think sometimes people overcomplicate it. I mean, I can tell you right now, when I get taught something new in boxing, it might be a bit of a skill, and I try and pull it off. It's good to practice it in sparring and stuff, which I was doing this morning. But when, <coughs> I'm, when, I'm, when I'm losing, or I feel like someone's got the upper hand, I always say to myself when I get back in the corner, go back to basics. Just do the jab, just do the basic stuff. 100%. And you find you start getting the upper hand again. So I think it's a very, very valuable lesson. The last thing then, when I wrap, wrap up any podcast, whether I'm doing it on my own or interviewing someone, I've got my catchphrase, which is, be happy, never content. I've got my own slant on that, what that means. I've got, it's something that I've come up over the last few years. If I were to say that to you and just say, what does that mean to you? Be happy, never content. When you're content, you become complacent. When you're content, you relax. When you're happy, you can always strive for more. That's how I'll take that. Wicked. Anton, thank you. I'm very humbled and very honoured to have you on my podcast. Thank and, you for um, having me. I'm sure it's going to do a lot for the audience, but for me personally, it's, it's done a lot, and well, I, I do you. mean that. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Appreciate Cheers. it, man. Cool.